For the past six days, teams have struggled through one of the most challenging environments on Earth, the tropical jungle of Fiji. With over half of the teams already succumbing to the brutal competition, time is running out for those still on the course. In this final stage of the race, one team will be crowned Eco Challenge champion, while many more will be forced to relinquish their dreams and drop out of the race. As the leaders endure a 30-mile sea kayak to Waia Island, they will soon face a terrible surprise. What appears to be a short hike over the island is actually a brutal 15-hour death march, the hardest trek on the course. The trek will take them through eight-foot-tall razor grass under the blazing Fijian sun on battered and swollen feet. Even for those that survive this trek, they still have more than 40 miles of paddling across open ocean before they will reach the finish line in Nandi. One hundred miles behind the leaders, the Smirnoff Ice Playmates have spent the last day battling the constant rain and unusually cold temperatures. Plagued by swollen and infected feet, the Playmates find that something as simple as putting on a shoe can be an excruciating experience. Carrie had a, a big problem putting on her shoe. She couldn't get her shoe on. She, at this point, had uh, her toenail was infected and coming off. You wanted, the pain was so excruciating, I cannot explain to you. <laughs> no, the shoe was just too tight at this point. So we had to cut her shoe. I'm going to strip them off. Uh, I just watch where I put them. Uh, if that helps or anything else. <laughs> that moment was was so painful. I thought, how can I possibly keep going? Driven by a relentless determination to finish the race, the playmates have no idea that the worst suffering is still to come. After 10 hours of paddling on the open seas and still in the lead, an exhausted Spanish team arrives on Waia Island to a festive Fijian welcome. The Spanish were only 24 hours away from finally winning their first eco-challenge, but the constant pressure from the Americans and Kiwis has forced them to keep moving and neglect their physical condition. For David, the pain in his feet is so intense he can hardly walk a few steps, let alone trek for the next 15 hours. With a seven-hour lead, the Spaniards face a deja vu from their ill-fated race in Morocco. The Spaniards' hope of pulling off a dramatic upset comes to a shocking and tragic conclusion. When we arrived, we ate, we slept, and when he got up, he couldn't do a step. It was, for us, the wall came down. I couldn't imagine why the infection was such worse in that moment. His feet was all completely infected. I 
our minds were completely destroyed. I was completely upset and I couldn't imagine why at 20 hours to finish we had to say goodbye. <laughs> It was a hard decision, but the only one. What can we do if one of our guys cannot step, cannot walk anymore? It was very hard. When we opened the radio, I just started to cry. Team 33 is calling to the doctor. Team 33, Roger, you're requesting a medical rescue. Yes, we have a team member that is uh, with uh, the feet completely injured. For me, the feeling was, oh my God, what an opportunity that we lost. But it's okay. <laughs> yeah. And we will look uh, backwards and we will see the Fiji 2002 and we will think about it because I think that my first thought will be with a long race, we nearly did it. We nearly finished first. Unaware that the Spanish have dropped out of the race, the American defending champions of Team Golight arrive at Waia Island, checkpoint 13. Though the Kiwis are a strong paddling team, the Americans pass them on the ocean at some point during the night. The Americans haven't slept and fatigue from racing six days straight, plus a bout of seasickness, is taking its toll. She got pretty seasick. Uh, so, getting seasick is always a tough thing. Hard to recover from. And she's just having a little rest right now to see if she can recover. Team Golight's rest is short-lived, as the Kiwis suddenly appear on the shores of Waia Island. With the Spanish out of the race, these two bitter rivals will now face off. For Nathan, this rematch will provide an opportunity to settle the score from last year's crushing defeat. The Spanish look like they're out. They're black. They look like they might be out. And there was a lot of memories of last year where we were racing the Kiwis neck to neck. Yeah, we're just sort of looking after ourselves and, you know, just kind of keep being, trying to stay on top of it. So, oh, I reckon we should get out of here. So we should, we need to get a move on because we can get all this done in the daylight today. Okay. If we're smart. Come on! Once we got into the front, there was no way we were going to sort of look back. It was just too good an opportunity. We've been given a gift, really, and it would have been a terrible, terrible waste to have uh, not, you know, maximised that. In front of this point, can you yeah. not show us where the trail is? Just where it starts. Yes, just, just where it starts. Start. And, Thank and you. Just to the red, yeah. 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 It's a full-on race again. It's almost like the start. All the competitive teams are in one group. The adrenaline is high, and we're all racing flat out against each other. While one of the greatest rematches in the history of the sport unfolds on Waia Island, 100 miles behind at checkpoint seven, the Brazilians' worst fears are realized as Nora falls deeper into the grip of the infection. It's so magical. I don't know how I'm gonna count. Have you guys made a decision yet? I'm talking to her now. Oh, this thing was a fake story. It's was a fake. See. Vamos parar. No. Sua mão tá. Sua mão. Tá prestes a cair. Não, eu acho que vamos conversar, ver o que vai acontecer. Vamos fazer o seguinte, você tem que ver um médico, isso não tem... Não tem... Não, não. Eu... 
Você até o meio de chegar, cara, você tem, 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 você pode decidir, mas é, provas tem resto da vida, cara. A vida. Só tem uma, só tem uma, cara. Within 24 hours, she's got some type of infection in her, on her left hand and both legs, and it's spreading up her hand and both legs. If she's not seen by a doctor, it's going to continue to get worse. So, like, like I said before, you guys have to make the decision on what to do. But if it was my teammate and it was me, I would see a doctor. Yeah, I think she's... So even though you're going to be disqualified from it, you still have to look, you know, for her health or Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. If the doctor yes. comes here to see her, you will be disqualified. Um, you will be unranked. So we, we can we call even if you, even if if he says she can continue. Yes. Yeah. You, you guys have talked to yourselves right now. You have to make the call on what yeah. you're doing because we have to know whether to put a medic on the helicopter or not. Just What do you want them to do now? I want to continue the race. Five years we're gonna win the Eco Challenge, so doesn't matter. Uh, it was a very bad feeling to have to make the call, especially because Nora was like begging me not to make the call, but I had no choice because it was her health, you know, her life. Uh, I'm from Team 7, AX and Brazil, and one of her team members is very sick, and we need a doctor here. It's very sad to make that decision, because we work very, very hard for one year, and we thought we were disappointing, a lot of people do, we were like, there's nothing we could do. If there were anything we could do, we would do it. But she was really bad. She needed a doctor. She needed to be in the hospital. It was very sad to see Nora being taken away. Very sad. I couldn't think very straight because my head was messed up, I think. And we put Nora in the helicopter, everybody started to cry. It was like a dream was going, you know, away. Nora will be taken to a field hospital and begin the long recovery to health. But for the women of Team AXN Brazil, their dream of finishing top 10 has been crushed. Holed up in a village for the last eight hours, the usually merry pranksters of Team Go are unable to move. After persevering through their own race of beating the cutoffs, their minds now must give in to the drastic condition of their bodies. With the infections of the jungle rendering them immobile, Team Go is forced to drop out. Rather than uh, go through the absolute torture of attempting to, to make a cutoff that we knew we couldn't make, we decided to pull out of the race. We finally have brought ourselves to the, the, the terrible you know, realization that, that we won't be able to uh, continue on the course um, and no matter what. The look on everyone's face, we were beaten. We'd just been beaten down. The jungle just got the better of us. We all thought with two hours rest we could get up and then one by one we woke up and nobody actually wanted to get up. HQ, HQ, this is Team 49, Team Go OxyClean. We are in the Nusaba village. Uh, we're requesting medical evacuation for two competitors. I remember for the rest of my life the words out of Dave's mouth when he broke radio silence. And I remember just sitting there listening to him say those words. And after seven days of just being out there, it really, really sucked. You feel like a loser because you're crying for help. All the early miles that we did from our getting lost I really started to, to weigh on us, it really took a toll. That's Michael Eck, uh, his condition is uh, he's immobile. 
we weren't going to make the cutoff because we were moving too slowly and we could have gotten ourselves into a dangerous situation out in the uh, the next jungle section. I didn't see it coming really, but uh, you know, sometimes that happens. The race got the best of us this time. You know, we give it a good shot though. Come on, next time. I will for sure. <laughs> next time I'm here, I'm definitely stopping it. <laughs> I was disappointed, not only that we were leaving the race, but that we were leaving the race and we were in the back of the pack. I think we're going to have a real successful attempt one of these times, and I think we're going to be running where we want to go in the middle of the pack. And I'm excited for the next one. You know, I'm ready to go now. Eco Challenge has raised the bar for difficulty now, and we're going to have to do a lot of things better, and so are all the other teams. We're going to have to spend the next year trying to catch up. We really want to compete. You know, we do have a strategy. It may not be very apparent, but Team Go is and will be a force to be reckoned with. While many are succumbing to the challenge of the expedition, Team Earthlink refuses to surrender, despite a race marred by bad luck. We get down from the waterfalls, you know, with this half hour sleep in the last 48 hours, and we knew that there was supposed to be this massive 37 mile road trek, but we'd heard that they'd changed it to this to uh, a shuttle in these Chevy Avalanches, and that was the, the best news we'd ever heard. Oh, look at these Chevy Avalanches, baby. Yeah. That's a great commercial. I'm gonna give you a ride down to the beach in the Chevy truck. Okay, all four in one beach. truck? All four in one okay. truck. So, um, climb in with your bags, and um, if I could have your passport. With only an ocean kayak and the brutal island trek left to go, Team Earthlink faces a superhuman task to catch the leaders. I wanted to get over to the boats because I knew that we had a fairly good paddling team and I wanted to get to those boats as soon as possible. I pretty much should have been in the that uh, keeps you going. Like I said, that unbreakable faith. There's always a miracle to be found somewhere. And if you give up, you're not going to find it. If you keep going, you never know. As Earthlink begins the long paddle to Waia Island, the race for the championship is intensifying. With the Kiwis capitalizing on their powerful momentum, Ian Adamson realizes once again that he must gamble his team's race on a risky strategic maneuver. And here we are. Uh, final day, final hours, and now what do we do? How are we going to beat these guys? These guys are running so strong at this point in time. They're, they're so fired up. They've been passing teams for the last three, four days, and now they're at the front of the race in their element. So all we could do was think, all right, let's race our race. Let's race smart. Let's just make it happen. We're gambling that we'll have to be able to duke it out at the high end. The Kiwis have chosen to climb over the peak of the island through eight-foot-tall razor grass while Ian decides to coast steer around the island. What happened was the Kiwis had gone up over the top of the peak on the south end of the island and continued on around to the northern checkpoint, way up in the north point. We had gone up the peak, looked at the terrain, come back down the way we'd gone up and went around the coastline because it was low tide. We are also aware that it could backfire a little bit we were actually doing really well on the island. We weren't as quick as the Kiwis, but we were maintaining a good steady pace. We weren't making any real mistakes, nothing that cost us any substantial amount of time or anything. Until we got to the little co-steering swim, which was just before checkpoint 14. We opted to swim around these cliffs rather than hike around the cliffs. We thought it would be faster. We also thought it would be some time off of our feet. And so we got in the water and started swimming, and Ian sort of took off swimming on his own. He was uh, with his snorkel and mask and fins and everything on, so he was moving quite quickly. And we went a little further out beyond the breakers. Mike was having a little bit of struggling with swimming. It's not his favorite event. So the three of us stuck together because we thought it would be safer. The seas were pretty rough where we were swimming, and there were some rocks and exposure out there. And we were going a little further around to the sandbar 
to la land our little trio here. And then as we got to the sandbar, we realized Ian was nowhere to be found. We got out of the water and I looked at the checkpoint and Ian wasn't there. So at that point, we didn't know where he was. And to be honest, I was a little worried for him because the seas were rough and I didn't know if Ian had gotten washed ashore or what. I, I didn't know what happened to him. As the surging Kiwis move further ahead, Team Golite must confront their worst fears. Ian, one of the strongest athletes in the competition, is lost at sea. Fighting dwindling time and daylight, rescuers scramble to find Ian before nightfall. Although a thorough search of the coastline turns up nothing, Ian manages to find his way to his teammates. Ian's mistake has now put his team two hours behind the Kiwis. I had some off with my team, but I had some somewhat faster. I looked at the cliff line and I could see a trail. So I decided to jump out fairly quickly and run up the trail. I ran all the way back to where we got in the water to start with, not seen them there, ran back up again, looked around the corner to see if I could see anyone, but all I saw was some villages. He said, oh no, my team had gone a different way. This was the most stupid thing that, that I did the entire race. We got Ian back down the ridge, onto the coastline, and ran in, ran back into the checkpoint with us. Yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, right. Well, you guys did the logical thing. You were just sitting out ahead of you, which I was. That was really frustrating, because it cost us probably two hours. I think we just got a little bit negligent at that point. That's a mistake that, that we shouldn't have made. That was sort of a rookie mistake, and it's, it's frustrating that we lost that kind of time. Going into the last part of the last section, pretty much, thinking, oh, we blew that one, didn't we? But at the same time, we, we looked at each other and went, how many times we said this, this race? How many times we said it each day this race? And it hasn't been true. So at that point, we said we could leapfrog the Kiwis in the next few hours. It was what had been happening for the entire race in every leg the lead would change every time. So we were back on the warpath. Back at Vua Falls, surging flood water from the relentless rain has now rendered the waterfall too dangerous to climb. Though the ropes have been closed, race organizers will allow teams to continue, but they must head up straight through the thick, muddy jungle. While many teams choose to drop out, the playmates are unwilling to quit, despite the overwhelming odds. We were more efficient in the water, just kind of half swimming and half, you know, holding onto the rocks. All of us were shivering, like, uncontrollably. It was so cold. We had been cold all through the night, all day, for like two days. Not, we weren't dry, we were wet, shivering. And I think it just finally caught up to us. And so I blew up a pack raft, because I didn't want the girls to be boulder hopping with their big with their big packs on, and I had them blow up all their pack rafts so that they would have something to stabilize themselves as they waded upstream. We got on the riverbed, and it was so cold, and um, Danelle was really very quiet. Sat down on the rock, and I started blowing up a pack raft, and I started getting this awful chill, and I started falling asleep while I was blowing up the pack raft. I started going downhill right about there. I don't really know what was happening, and uh, I just kept getting colder and colder and colder and uh, my mind, like thoughts weren't connecting and time wasn't connecting. I look at Danelle and I realize she doesn't look good. She, we're all hurting, but she's hurting more than I've ever seen her. I, I have to camp. I, I knew myself, I could not go on. I had to camp. The word epic was written all over the situation. And, uh, and if we were to continue on in the dark, it wouldn't just be an epic, it could be, you know, a tragedy. And Danelle, was, it was kind of weird, she said she was really cold, but I could tell just standing close to her that she was hot, she was just radiating heat. Due to prolonged exposure to the elements, Danelle has slipped into an advanced stage of hypothermia, an extremely dangerous condition. All I remember, uh, I sat down, and I, I don't remember anything.
With each passing hour, time grows shorter for teams at the back of the pack. Faced with yet another mandatory time cutoff, Mad River is among the massive teams barely reaching the base of Bua Falls before the deadline. Though the Playmates chose to push on in spite of the odds, Team Mad River finds their situation hopeless. They have only six hours to make the next race cutoff, and this section of the course took even the best teams nearly 24 hours. Exhausted, they realize they have no chance of making it in time. We get up there, and I hand the passport, and she tells us these are off. She says, the other teams took 40 hours to do this checkpoint. They're giving us six. And we don't get to ascend ropes because the ropes are closed. We went back down and told the guys, and the options were limited. It was the biggest surprise of the entire race. Nobody wanted to crack open the radio. Can we break up the radio? No one wanted to use that damn thing, and no one wanted to punch out of the game. Like, I knew there were no options, but I just wasn't ready to actually physically do it. Team 54 to headquarters. Team 54, go ahead. We're at the waterfall right now, and decided that we're, uh, we're unable to make the next checkpoint on time. So we are withdrawing. Can we get a... Uh, a for one of our teammates. Uh, Roger, I copy. You need a helicopter for one teammate. It's the worst feeling. Coming this far, going through all the preparation, being as lucky as we were, having the, the highest top highs, the lowest of lows. I went into this race terrified that I would be the weakest member and quickly found out that all of us would be at different times. I can't believe how much pain I just went through, how much I pushed it to make the, the checkpoint in time, and now I can't continue. Disappointment is overwhelming. I'm not sure if we garnered any respect from other teams. I think we did. I think we impressed a lot of people, but I think we're not just going to be respected, we're going to be looked out for in the future. We have a strong team. The race beat me, you know, and I want to beat the race. You know, next time we're going to come back stronger, better, and we're not going to let, let the race beat us. In the middle of the seventh night, an emergency call comes out from the Playmates. Believe is suffering from either hypothermia or she has some kind of fever and she's shivering uncontrollably and we don't know what to do. She just she couldn't really talk one word at a time and you'd have to ask her several times just to get one word and she was shivering uncontrollably. She was hot, you know, she was far hotter than any of us and it was kind of weird. That was probably the longest night of my life, uh, watching her breath, um, you know, just checking her, her skin, her the, her muscles, everything. She was just hard as a rock from shaking all night. Um, I was really, really scared for her. Literally, I was looking at her thinking, is she still alive? I was afraid she was going to die on us. I really was. I had no idea. And if she wasn't going to die with that high fever for 12 hours, what's it going to do to her brain? It was really scary. And I just, I kept looking at my watch, just hoping another hour had gone by and we were closer and closer to daylight. Eventually, some people on foot came uh, real early in the morning. And it was quite nice to finally see their headlamps come around the corner. It was, there was a guy named Saba and another guy named John, and Big John was a Fijian. And they propped her up, and Big John put his hand on her shoulder and said, now we pray for her, now we pray for her. That's all we can do, we pray for her to Jesus Christ. And then he prayed in Fijian. We didn't understand uh, a word, but we all... We all fully understood the message, and at that point, we were all praying for her.
Refusing to give up, a beleaguered Team Earthlink arrives at Waia Island, far behind, but still in contention. Thank you. And I think once we arrived at Waia Island, we were so committed to finishing this race that there was nothing in the world that was going to stop us. Oh. And when you sit down in a kayak for eight hours, your feet start aching. Oh, they just throb and they hurt. And the idea of doing 37 kilometers on these stumps that will barely, will barely move and, uh, and with feet that are so agonizing to put your weight on, you can't even imagine it. Robin was crying hysterically. Like she was honestly out of her mind. She's not a real super emotional person. I've never seen her cry as much in my life, in any race as much as she did when we had to go do that hike. I mean, she was really, really upset about it. It was just too much. You guys, I don't think this hike is gonna be that bad. What makes you say that? Everyone is telling us it's gonna be like <coughs> Dude, that's so thorn bad. bushes straight up hills. It's ugly? Yeah. You said it was ugly? Yeah. You good? Ugly. Define ugly. Over around 15 is ugly, huh? Yeah. He said it's brutal. There were so many times that we should have given up hope, called it quits. But every single time we rallied and, and came forward and, and got our acts back together and just kept the dream alive. We had overcome so much to get there. We weren't going to let bad feet and a long course let the, yet to go defeat us from finishing this race. The human spirit is a lot stronger than I ever dreamed among these four people on Team Earthlink. In what has turned out to be the hardest race she's ever done, Robin still faces a brutal 15-hour trek. Showing why she's a true champion, she refuses to quit and forces her weary body to move forward. After finishing the island trekking loop and returning to their kayaks, the Kiwis prepare for the final ocean paddle. I've only slept for like 10 minutes in the last 40 hours, so I'm feeling a little bit jaded. It just, it took us so by surprise that we actually, that we found ourselves in the front. Like yesterday morning we started, we were in ninth place, and by the end of the day we were in, uh, in second. It was just took us by so much by surprise that we didn't really have time to process it too much. You know, it's kind of going to be all, all, all on the way to finish. It's so hard when you're in front because you don't know what's going on, you know, they could be five minutes behind you or they could be an hour or two, two hours behind, so that's pretty freaky, you know. As the Kiwis set out in the final sprint to the finish line, the defending champions of Team Golite are right behind. With a remarkable similarity to last year's dramatic finish in New Zealand, the Americans and Kiwis are set to battle it out to see who will reign as the Eco Challenge Fiji champion. Anything in heaven. We said that an injury could affect the Spanish, which it did. Weather could blow up here and really hammer the race, which it could. Who knows, we might be the ones that get taken out in this one. But uh, I don't think so. Right now, it's every minute can count, and they're awfully good paddlers. But we did know that to have any chance at all of catching the Kiwis, we had to paddle like crazy. At that point in the race, you gotta just keep your head into the game, you know? We wanted to finish first. So, once again, we were just gonna persevere and just keep pushing forward. While the Kiwis and Americans battle it out for the lead, rescue personnel battle to save Danelle Folta's life. Yeah, the our teammate, Danelle Folta, is in serious condition. Team 81 HQ, Roger. Worst shape with a lot of them. A couple of pairs of hands, Kevin. Kevin. Roman, you're up to it. She seemed to be pretty bad. You know, it wasn't. It doesn't seem to be just a case of hypothermia and exhaustion. Maybe that's all it is. There seems to be something else. No. Hey, we're just gonna put some oxygen back on you now. It was the most horrible night. It was so scary because I was afraid she was going to stop breathing. I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. I don't know what happens when you get hypothermia. I just know that people can die from it. 
the helicopter just landed, bringing the Smirnoff Ice Playboy Extreme Team out of the jungle. And they're all safe, although Danelle has been admitted to our field hospital, and so our doctors are taking a good look at her now. Work with us here. Open your eyes for me. Open your eyes. Okay, now open your eyes for me. Here we are. Here we are. With her husband by her side, Playmate Danelle Folta clings to life in the Eco Challenge Field Hospital, showing the same gritty determination that pushed her through the race. Danelle has fought back against the infection and finally regains consciousness. I think Eco Challenge is an equal opportunity destroyer and treats male, female, beautiful, ugly, old, young, all the same. As I remember, I was talking to a woman saying, I can't, I, I, I think we should camp. And then that's all I remember. <laughs> and then I, I woke up here and my husband's here. <laughs> We went so much further than so many people, and we had so many reasons to quit. It's a huge victory to me. I think we hung in there, and I think we showed we're tough. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Even though they didn't finish the race due to a medical evacuation, the Smirnoff Ice Playboy team did incredibly well and once again shattered any stereotypes about being a woman or being beautiful it means you're weak. They are not weak. They put in an awesome performance. In a complete reversal of last year's dramatic finish, Ian's last minute mistake on the co-steering section has ironically cost the Americans the race. Nathan and the Kiwis proudly and triumphantly paddle to the finish line to claim this year's Eco Challenge crown. When we were paddling the last section, there was definitely a glow of contentedness, a glow of achievement, you know? All right, we've done this. the race knowing that we really needed to win this one to sort of redeem a bit what happened last year in New Zealand. Team New Zealand. It was particularly sweet to win the race and, and to beat Go Light for sure. No matter what was happening or what never, no matter what happened we never gave up and we constantly thought yep we can win this race. Yeah I think when I look back on this race I'm always going to have good memories when you win it's always you always remember lots of good things, but I think it was particularly special for me because it was in the Polynesian Islands and I've got Polynesian blood in me and it was just really important for me to have a good result here. I sort of felt like I was sort of representing um, a lot here. Every section was just really hard, really brutal. And on top of that, I was sick. It also made it a hard course. Saying that, being the hardest course also makes it the most uh, uh, satisfying to win. Only a few hours behind, Ian Adamson and the American defending champions will cross the line in a hard-earned second place. Coming around the corner, seeing the finish line, even though it was for second place, was still a great relief and a welcome sight. But when you look back, second place for what we had encountered and the mistakes and the mishaps we had is really respectful. In this year's race, it was great racing neck and neck with the Kiwis. They're an awesome team. I have a lot of respect for them. Highly intelligent racers, incredibly athletic. Um, they have very few weaknesses. And congratulations to them, you know, that they were the best team on the day. For the Americans and the Kiwis, their rivalry is far from settled. 
Though Nathan is redeemed from last year's disappointing loss, now the score stands even at one and one, fueling an even greater rivalry next year. A hard-fought third place goes to the Aussies of Team Air Pacific, a mere three hours behind the Americans. For a dark horse rookie team from South Africa, they have astonished even the best of the best with an amazing fourth place finish. The South Africans will now be regarded as a force to contend with, but their unparalleled courage and humble manner embody the true spirit of Eco Challenge. When we were paddling towards the finish line, I think it was the first time we could actually accept that we were going to finish in fourth place. The fact that we squeezed into top five is more than my wildest dreams. It's, it's just a huge sense of satisfaction for us. Overcoming bad luck, near race-ending mistakes, and uncharacteristic team dissension, Team Earthlink's fifth place finish is a testament to these former champions' courage and competitive spirit. We couldn't be more happy or more proud or more happy with each other, frankly. You know, to have gone to hell together and, and made it back as, as well as we did is an incredible accomplishment. We're bonded for life. I feel like these are the best competitors in the world. They shouldn't just trust me. I should have to earn their trust. This race was about that for me. This is about earning their trust. And I hope I did that. I hope that was that goal was accomplished. I'm thrilled to even just have survived it. Like I, I'm prouder of surviving Eco Challenge Fiji in fifth place than I'm winning Eco Challenge Borneo in first place. Eighty-one teams began the journey. Only 10 teams finished the entire course. For the competitors, this Eco Challenge will be remembered as the toughest expedition race ever staged. But even for those that didn't cross the finish line, they will take with them an unforgettable experience. A moment that will change their lives forever.